since we're talking about movies, I went back. Uh, Pluto TV is, um, which I think is owned by Viacom, but they've got an 80s Rewind channel, which is actually really good. They so, show a lot of good movies. Uh, Delta Force, 1986, Chuck Norris, Chuck Lee Norris. Marvin. It's been on in rotation. You know, I've got Alan Silvestri's theme rolling in my head with, with the drums. You know, um, the, 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 the Alan Silvestri is one of, one of the great Hollywood um, you know, guys that score movies, but, th and it's funny because this is like all electronic, which is very obviously indicative of the times, but yeah, eighties, you know, it's, in, it's an interesting film because, um, it's Lee Marvin's last film that he ever did. Um, Chuck was on the that. ascendancy. It's, it's Canon films. So, you know, and Canon made a lot of, they made some really good movies, some really iconic movies in the eighties. And they made a lot of really bad movies, but either way, they were real risk takers. They were run by a couple of Jews uh, Golan and, <laughs> Golan and Globus. That's um, right. And and there's a great documentary that I encourage everybody to check out. It's called Canon Films. Uh, it's called Electric Boogaloo: The Unauthorized Tale of Canon Films. And oh, it's that's where just, the Boogaloo Boys took their name from, right? Well, that's from crazy. Breakin. The movie Breakin was the first one that Canon Films. Did. And then it was, it was called about, Electric Boogaloo. The the, uh, the sequel was Breakin Two: Electric Boogaloo. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and he, these these are some of the more awful films that Canon made, but they're so <laughs> bad that they're good at this point. I mean, they've kind of achieved. That I want to test some status. stuff from. So in Hollywood weapons, we were, it's funny you're talking about this because, you know, we're hoping to get a season six. We just did five. And I've been wanting to test stuff from Delta Force, the Delta Force movies for a while. We may even have a, a line in to talk to Chuck Norris. But also mm. I want to get on one of my good friends who's a retired Delta Force guy. Um, he works with me on a test force dagger. And um, and I wasn't, I wasn't there. They're, they're down there now in Key West. I couldn't go because I, I couldn't be away from my mom that long, like for like two months straight I, with the filming and brag and not. But I want to get him on because I asked him, I said, dude, would you be able to come on camera and we could talk about, you know, the Delta Force movies? And he was like, and he's great on film. He's like super stud guy, you know? Yeah. So the, I love those movies, man. I grew up, we, we grew up with those, I mean, we grew up with them. Yeah, I, I think I saw Delta Force on cable and then obviously it, it, it was a big... VHS. It was a big, you know, home rental. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. I was I was watching this and I could not believe who's in this movie. You've got um, Joey Bishop, Robert Vaughn, um, Shelley Winters. I had to go George, back and see this. Yeah. George, George Kennedy is the priest. Um, <laughs> and then you've got Liam Neeson, who uh, is uncredited, who's one of the Delta Force guys. But um, something else in this that I never realized and I don't know if you guys ever realized this, but you know who Robert Forster is from yeah. The Black Hole and Jackie Brown? That's the bad guy in the Delta Force. All right, I got to go back and see this now. It's been a long time since I've seen it. You know, you know, they've obviously got some makeup on him. They got the mustache and the hair. I think they even gave him some mascara to make him look really mm -hmm. Arab. But I mean, he is he's unrecognizable and he's, and you know, Robert Forster, he's always played these good guys. These, he's got that trustworthy face. You know, it's like, yeah. for me, it's like, that's, that's the guy in the black hole from Disney. But they could man. also talk about those movies back then. You could talk about fighting jihadists and you wouldn't have to deal with it. That's the Dude, problem. Well, all the jihadists like in the seventies and eighties movies were played by Italians. Right. Right. <laughs> well, well, what's funny is this movie opens up to operation Eagle claw. I did not know that. Um, but that's part of the story which is, his, you know, that's Jimmy Carter's, um, you know, you know, big biff back in the 70s with the Delta Force. Um, so the whole idea was to kind of, and then it's also based on the TW-8 Flight 87 hijacking and then like another, um, uh, some kind of operation, uh, Operation Entebbe, uh, from what I understand. So there's some real world stuff that's worked into this movie, but it's very Hollywood. It's very over the top. Yeah. Um, but it's, but in my, in my memory, it's kind of the last movie where Hollywood was brave enough to go in and make a bunch of radical Islamic jihadis, the bad guys, and allowed the Americans to just open up a huge can of whoop ass all over them. Because if you, you watch the Delta do that Force, now. you can't do that now. You I mean, Delta do. Force, they abs I mean, you want to talk about one big American country ass kicking. That's what Delta Force is from beginning to end. Yeah. <laughs> it's you just can't awesome. do that now. Now you have to turn our our enemies into, you have to humanize them. Okay. You have to make, you have to take their point of view. You have to also apologize for what we did. Mm -hmm. And it's just, that's it's, how, well, and that's like our like legitimate enemies. They, like, they create ones for the movies. Like it's, you know, 
a corporation or something, which is actually kind of ironic, but <laughs> they, you know, create a, a fake, you know, corporation. It's never going to be, um, oh, the enemy in this movie is um, a social media giant that reads <laughs> your thoughts or something like that. Right. You know, they create, um, you know, like a Mitt Romney type of yeah. Well, to talk about the culture, though, like the other night I, I was at my mom's house and she was watching, I think there's a, there's a show called FBI or something. I think it's like a crime show. And it was, I could hear it from down below. And I to, I had to tell her to turn it down. It was, it was all about white supremacy. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, now it's like the Proud Boys are somehow like the evil corporation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like they're like, they're the ones that are going to take down the country. It's like. No, that's not what's happening. But yeah. but that's what that's what it is. You can't talk about, you know, they talk about the greatest generation, and they are. Uh, but like, would you call all those cats that came back from World War II? Are they racist because they called the enemies Japs and Krauts yeah. or Jerry? No, yeah, yeah, they wouldn't, because because that's because they're your enemy. Because that's that's who we fought, and that's how we. And but if we said something, if we know what we call our enemies downrange, Braxton, but we don't, we can't do that here. Because we would get in trouble for I literally would get in trouble for that shit. Well, that like, was one of the ironies of Memorial Day. Like liberals were posting pictures of like the Battle of Normandy and being like, this is what the real Antifa looks like. And I'm like, you would have hated every single one of those guys politically if you actually knew what they believed. Like, no. it's just, they all came home and gave money to Eisenhower. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, along with all the Hollywood people that served too. I mean, that was yeah. when Hollywood was center right, was yeah. post World War II. Jimmy I Stewart mean, was a bomber pilot. Yeah. All these yep. guys, I mean, I mean, even like, you know, we were talking about George Kennedy, a lot of these guys served um, in, in, you know, I, you know, maybe not all of them, maybe some of them were in the rear with the gear. Some of them, you know, were in infantry, but uh, that obviously had a direct impact on the culture when they came back, because you look at the movies that Hollywood made post-World War II from To Hell and Back and The Longest Day. And I mean, these, these are not liberal movies. They do not have liberal messaging whatsoever. Um, well, and they also got signals from the people, from the ticket buyers that they wanted to see this. And I think that's probably what's missing now is everything is like so niche. Like the thing that rises to the top is, you know, like some Godzilla super, lizard. Thing. Yeah. Well, well, that's, and well, well because gets, it's, it's yeah. for, you know, a global market. So that's market. also like what makes you think, does a boycott matter if everything is tailored to a, a global market? If every American did decide not to see the super superhero movie like what would have to be the threshold for it to matter well i don't know all those navy seal movies made a crap load of money yeah, yeah. Those, those are really good yeah. Yeah. American, american sniper made a ton of money lone survival made a ton of money um what's his name the the sniper um the black guy he's got his own tv show or he sold that to hollywood nick, nick, nick oh, irving nick, nick yeah, irving nick. right um okay. I mean, I mean, yeah, man. I mean, when when they do these and they do them right, like that movie, the um, the Outpost, which has Scott Eastwood, which is all based on real live events, I think, in Afghanistan. When they do it right, American audiences love it and they go crazy for it. And that's why I was thinking, I'm watching Delta Force, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, this movie's kind of ahead of its time. It's obviously a product of the era and Reaganism and patriotism. And the two guys making the movies were probably would be branded as Zionists today. A hundred percent, but they're very pro-American. Um, you know, Canon Films did things like Bloodsport and American Ninja and that movie Invasion USA, which is even crazier than Delta Force. Um, but these guys were very pro-American and audiences ate that stuff up. Since there's a vacuum of that right now in American pop culture, I, you know, I watch this movie and I'm like, wow, you know, would, Amer are, I, would American audiences embrace this if this was made today in the same vein you know i'm not talking about some rebooted woke delta force right. but if they did yeah, i don't know that's I, i'm not sure they would man I don't, I don't know if there'd be a group of us would a lot of people would but i think maybe a lot of people would would kind of look at it as like sort of like yeah, no but then a girl like me could be the chuck norris character right <laughs> yeah swap it. in today's version <laughs> yeah i mean, I mean let's, let's gender swap it instead of chuck norris it's gina carano you yeah. know uh, mm -hmm. you know, alongside some Lee Marvin looking guy, well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, alongside Terry Shepard. So it's <laughs> like, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, that would probably work on a broader scale, but you know, look, there's 80 million Trump voters, give or take, there's a lot of people in the heartland. I, I think that they would, I think they, they'd go for something like that, but it would be totally panned as being, you know, it would get the American sniper treatment where they said it's just right wing jingoism and right wing propaganda. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, well, what's wrong with that? 
Yeah. You know, well, you know what like, sucked it's, about it's that too is me. These people that say I don't watch or I don't do this or that. And granted, I don't know if they're the minority or not, but if you're sending a message that it doesn't matter what they do, you don't go to the movies anymore. Um, you know. Well, it like American <laughs> Sniper was particularly, I thought, egregious because when that came out, before it was released, Bradley Cooper, who's a very fine actor, I mean He's a very talented guy. He was like, yeah, you know, I actually spent, he had spent time with Chris Kyle before Chris Kyle was killed. And then he was spent time with his wife, Taya. And, and, you know, he said, I really, these are really great people. And I really got to know them. And I spent, you know, I, I, I put a lot of work into it. And, and I think he did do a great job in the movie, but when it came out and everybody was calling Chris Kyle a racist and all this other kind of stuff, he never defended him. He, he never, like Bradley Cooper never stepped up and said, Hey, fucking shut up, man. Stop saying that. Go see the movie and you tell me, you know, like, and, but, and I don't think even Clint Eastwood really defended him. That I, much. I was just going to say, Clint, Clint doesn't do interviews, period. Yeah, but I mean, like, but, so I yeah, guess I that was disappointing because I thought that was kind of cowardly of someone like Bradley Cooper, who, of, of a list actor who basically that movie really kind of made his career. Honestly, yeah. it was a huge movie for him. And he talked up about how great Chris was and his family and how, you know, they're good people. But then when, when, when it got hot and people were calling it, you know, the reaction, the typical knee jerk reaction to this is like, oh, you know, he's a racist killer and all that. He never came out publicly defended him. So I was like, you know what? Fuck you, man. You know, like you never, you made a lot of money off the movie. You built your career on it. Understandably. So you put it as an actor, you put in a lot of work. I can appreciate that. But like, you could have defended him. You could have actually come out and said, hey, man, stop. That's not who he was. And, you know, this is, you know, you maybe take yourself out of your bullshit and just look at what he had to go through and how that changed him and all that kind of stuff. And he didn't do it. And I thought mm -hmm. that was really cowardly. So I think there's a lot of cowards in, in, in that business, too, that are not. No one's not. Everybody's going to like your stuff. Like <laughs> there's going to be, you know, there's going to be people yeah. who think the movie sucks. And you're going to you're going to you're not going to please you'll never please the far left. You will never please them. But like it kind of is like when when uh, when Mel Gibson was in Braveheart and he was talking to Robert Bruce, he goes, if you would just lead them, they would follow you. And so would I. And it's like that's kind of why I think the country's eager for something like that's why they, that's why we voted for Trump. You know, I know yeah. Trump's an asshole. Trump's an asshole. But like I think that's why we voted for him, because we just wanted someone who was just going to just kind of just. Not bend, not bend, not bend as much. He, he still bent a lot and all that. But I mean, like, you know what I mean? I think that's the country does. It hasn't been beaten out of the United States yet. They've tried. We've had 50 years or so of educational indoctrination where now people coming out of school think the country sucks. It needs to be torn down. You feel guilty for what color you are. You feel guilty for your success. So they've tried to beat that kind of American sort of independence, that American sort of self-reliance, that kind of American, that American vibe that really basically conquered the world. And they've, and they've done a good job of beating it out of us. So we have, you know, we have a lot of people now, like people like, we need a new Reagan. I said, we can't, Reagan, yeah, he wouldn't no, Reagan, Reagan, Reagan left office in 1988. That was 33 years ago. How much indoctrination has happened to the this country we could never have a guy like Reagan because we don't have the country that we had in 1988 and 1980 and 1984. We just don't have it. Like the, the people are different now. They think yeah. differently. They've been well, told and also, differently. I'm not like a Reagan basher, obviously, but people also forget like even there were elements of Reagan that didn't work, like a conservative giving in and saying, OK, we'll give amnesty to 10 million people. He got rolled. They're not going to stop. <laughs> now we he got rolled. And he even said that that was one of his greatest regrets. Yeah. was giving on that because they they never bargained in good faith and they fucking rolled him on that and he learned the hard way. They're never going to – again, that's the problem with the guys like you know some of the conservatives that, that are just like, well, it's just the free market. You're not understanding this. It's not the free market. It's not the – people are like when, – when Trump went after China, people who I respect were like, how is he oh, – this is awful. He's going to start a trade war. Which, first of all – there's we're in a trade war. Yeah. Yeah, we're in a trade war. We're, in, you know, the enemy has a say in this, and so China has been fighting the trade war. You just haven't been, you just haven't been paying attention, and you know. Well, well and also, well, everybody that wants to claim to be a purist on a lot of that stuff, and I don't necessarily mean, I don't mean libertarians, but I mean like, like probably more never Trumpers or you know, the conservatives that want to talk about the free market. 
they're also the first ones when, you know, a corporation makes a rainbow thing to sell it in June. They're just like, how can they do this? It's like free market. They want to sell the rainbow thing in June. You know, they they just pick and choose which culture yeah. fight they want to fight. It's funny how both sides get upset by it. It's like everyone realizes it's all fake, but like, I, I like the you know the, the gay side. Like the, the whole the past few decades have been saying all we want is you know society to accept us, and they're like, all right, sure, here's your own uh, whatever. Then it's <laughs> well, it's not genuine. It's like you really can't win no matter what. It's I like, bought Chris I, Barron's dog a rainbow shirt. <laughs> that's cute. Yeah, but the, the question is, what does he think about it? Who cares? I'm gonna put it on that dog. Well, I mean that, and that's that crap didn't start. The whole rainbow thing started in the '80s because Martina Navratilova got her own Mastercard, and Mastercard put a rainbow on it, and that's where this whole rainbow affiliation, you know, with the homos comes from. Hmm. Well, you know what's interesting is Martina uh, now has a very specific view about women in sports, and we're and we're not allowed to hear that. Mm -hmm. She's not really into the whole transgender competing against women thing. So mm -hmm. she's she's actually on our side. She thinks it's wrong. So she's a true feminist in that sense. Yeah. But getting um, getting into like what Braxton was talking about in his book, and I we do need to talk about his book. But um, you know, one of the things that we trip up on is ego, right? Ego. I've talked about that all the time, you know, but like, that's how, you know, the conservatives, conservative Inc. That's how, you know, for them, it's ego because mm -hmm. they never, it, they, if you think about it, they never gave Trump any credit at all. And yet Trump is the only president who went to the, uh, the March for life in DC, right? Every president's talked about it. Bush never went. None of the Bushes went. Reagan never went to it. Freaking Donald Trump, who I probably he probably paid people to have abortions when he was <laughs> right. Right. I mean, like, right. Yet he went because he knows that's his base. Like he'll show up to NASCAR mm -hmm. and have the have his have his limo do a lap and have Air Force One come over and all this other crazy. Like Trump was never afraid of his base. And so that was yet the conservative writers and I, guys like Jonah Goldberg, who wrote that great book, Liberal Fascism, in like 2007, <laughs> 2008. He never said a good thing about Trump because it became an ego thing for him mm -hmm. because it wasn't that he couldn't even admit that some of the stuff Trump was doing was good for the country and was adhering to conservative principles because it was Trump. And so two things can be true Two like, for example, two things can be true. John McCain was a war hero deserving of our respect, who was unforgivably insulted by Donald Trump. Right. Unforgivably insulted. That's true. It's also true that John McCain fucked the Republicans and conservatives by not repealing Obamacare, even though he said he was going to do that because he didn't want to give Trump the win because Trump had insulted him. So, like, you can have both of those things. You don't have to you don't have to defend one guy completely and say, well, Trump, you know, what, you know what I mean? Like, and that's, yeah, yeah. Those, the, those that, guys that's ego. It's not. ego. It's ego that got them like that's yeah. Ted Cruz was insulted ridiculously <laughs> by Trump. During the campaign, right? He was one. Of, he was one of the president. Yet Cruz, when Trump was doing conservative stuff, Cruz actually backed him. Same with same with uh, Rand Paul. Rand Paul, Rand Paul yeah. was completely insulted by Donald Trump, and yet Rand Paul has he put aside the ego because he was insulted by Trump, and he he got on board with some of Trump's policies if they fit what he thought was conservative policies. That's I respect those guys for that a lot because they, they could have said, fuck you, Trump. I'm not going along with you because you said this to me and blah, blah, blah. blah and you're a jerk. because He's a jerk. Yeah. But they put that aside. The ego was put down and they went with the program. John McCain couldn't do that. John McCain okay. couldn't do that. Well, I think well, one difference is that Cruz and Paul are, you know, they have to answer to constituents, whereas Jonah doesn't. <laughs> right. Right. Braxton, you were to say something, I cut you off. The problem with people like, that we have with veteran politicians is, like I made the joke on Twitter, um, when the currency collapses, you can uh, take, uh, what I say, take solace in the fact that it'll be a veteran who denies your VA benefits. Because, <laughs> like, this is what they do, you know? Like, John McCain was also on the wrong side of every foreign policy decision. Everyone. Like, he was really eager to send people like us over to do things that were probably not very wise in in retrospect and even at the time, you know. So yeah. I, it's frustrating to see these guys because you're right. He's absolutely a war hero. What he did in Hanoi is heroic. I mean, not yep. Trump is sort of right to say, well, getting shot down is not necessarily heroic. OK, fine. <laughs> but the way he behaved himself in Hanoi was absolutely heroic. You know, his dad right. was like the admiral or whatever. He could have got out whenever he wanted and he stayed and, you know, so. <clears throat> 
fine, good character in in war and all that. But then he came home and as a politician, in my opinion, did not demonstrate the best character in the world. Exactly. Say, like as a man, one time I was on a flight from Phoenix to DC and uh, McCain was on the same flight and they they double booked or overbooked or whatever the, the first class. And so McCain sat his wife in first class and he moved back like with us and coach, you know, with the plebs. So as an individual guy, he was probably a pretty decent guy. I, right. I His agree. wife probably paid for the tickets though. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> She's got all the money. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a good joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, Cindy's loaded. I mean, she, and, and she's old, old, old mm -hmm. Phoenix money. So it's, there's a lot of money, a lot of influence, a lot of passion. I mean, the McCain still wield a lot of power in Phoenix. Oh, wow. It's, it's crazy, man. I'm sure they do, but it's ego. It's always ego with these guys because it's, they got their lunch taken from them, you know, and they, they were not in the spotlight anymore. And, you know, the guy, they did that Trump wasn't their candidate. And so, you know, it became, you know, they're full of shit when a conservative writer can't give any credit at all to Trump. Like they didn't give any at all. So that. That just tells me maybe it wasn't really about conservatism with you. Maybe it really was always about your ego. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You you want you want to talk about ego for a minute? Some, something I've, that's always stuck with me in the primaries during the debates. You guys remember that last debate where Ben Carson got introduced and didn't hear his name, so he just hung so, back. Oh yeah. And Ted Cruz and Bush and, was the biggest ass. And you know Jeb Bush walked around. He's just like mm, you know, and you know walked off stage. And and Ben Carson's just sitting there, you know, like. You know, and now nobody's what? like now what? You know, and everybody's filing out. Trump hangs back with Ben Carson. I remember that. And then, and then when I think when and I think Trump's name had already been called. Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, but he that. but he hung back with Ben Carson until finally all everybody's name had been called and all of the other assholes had filed out and were standing in front of their podiums. And when everything was done, Trump and Ben Carson walked out together. Mm -hmm. But but I, I that that's always stuck huh. with me. From the standpoint of all those guys there, Rubio, all these dudes. I don't. I don't even remember. I think Rand Paul was already out on stage. Yeah, there's a lot of them already out. But like, but Jeb in particular, like, made a face. He was just like, "Okay, dude." I mean, he like kind of acknowledged, "You're an idiot. You didn't hear." Or he his, he made a face like, "You're an idiot. You didn't hear your name." Yeah. Um, and, you know, just very did, low like, energy. I'm going out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And again, two things can be true. You can have someone who, like like President Trump was, who was, you know, kind of a jerk and kind of petulant and, you know, he could be vengeful and he could be all those things. That's all okay. But he could also have done some good. He, got, he also, it's possible he did some good things for the country if you're a conservative. And I think the conservatives that refuse to acknowledge that really, one of the gifts of the Trump presidency for sure is the smoking out of so many people that heretofore we believed by what they said, maybe not so much what they did, but what they said and wrote that they were kind of on our side, you know, like they actually got it. They, they respected us and they, and they wanted the best for us. Trump, just because of who he is, just smoked out so many people. And I don't think there's no go, there's no going back for some of that. You know, that's, I, I don't yeah. think there's, you know, at this point now we know who you are. And yeah, so I don't, know what, I don't know what SC Cups target market is. Really. <laughs> the the, the, the um, same as the same as Jonah Goldberg and David yeah. French. I don't okay? get who's like I don't like what I whenever I see a Jen Rubin tweet and then I see twenty thousand people liked it, I go, who? Who Her, the, their target <laughs> yeah. market is the per the person who uh is in a CNN or Washington Post yeah. office and has to check a box, do we have a Republican? Check. Yep. It's that person. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have, yeah. we won't talk about it, but Baron and I have stories about SE and how she treated us. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, was, I, I, that was pretty well known. I but again, it was too. just, it makes you just think, you know, that was the whole thing a grift? I don't know. You know, I mean, I'd well, if like, you go back and look, Penn Jillette was on Red Eye one time with her. Yeah, he's schooled her. Yeah. yeah, he basically said, well, because Penn is a real atheist. Mm -hmm. And that was back when Essie's shtick was that she was a conservative atheist. Mm -hmm. right. And Penn was like, like just to her face on the show, I don't believe you really think that. I think you're just doing it to <laughs> for that to be like your thing. 
your your I, your way to sell books. I and think, she's like, "What? How dare you?" I think her <laughs> goal was if she continued in the conservative movement, she was going to convert, quote unquote, and that was going to no, be. That's a what he said. Story. He said, yeah, "I think yeah. your your long term goal is you'll you'll convert, and then that will be your thing." Yeah, it'll be. And, I have more but credibility. He was right. He because did I convert, used to just not to a Christian. I mean, she might be a Christian, but she converted to something else. Hmm. Yeah. So she was a sellout the whole time, basically. She's yeah. making a lot of money. Good on her, I guess. Well, no, hey. and that, I mean, that's like what I said with is like, that's kind of like the theme in books that can sell. It's, you know, I'm a conservative and a woman and black and, you know, a former Democrat I'm, and I'm an gay. atheist or, right. you know, all, all of those you know, types of things. <laughs> I'm a conservative and a Trump supporter. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. She's, uh, it reminds me of that. The, there's a great quote that um, Martin Sheen has in Wall Street um, af after meeting Gordon Gecko, his, his son, you know, Bud Fox introduces him to Gordon Gecko, and they're going down the elevator and have this big fight. And Martin Sheen looks at, at Charlie Sheen and he goes, look, he goes, I don't, I, I don't, I don't sleep with no whore, and I don't wake up with no whore, and that's how I live with myself, you know. And and when I look at people, you know, like um, you know David French or Jonah, who the only people they answer to are those assholes that pay for the ticket to go on the t the cruise with them, basically. You know, it's like every time I every time I see those guys, I'm just kind of like ahoy, you know. Back in, I was gonna say, you know, back in um, CPAC like 2000. Seven two thousand eight, you know, when Romney was running the first time and lost, uh, the French has had an organization called Evangelicals for Romney, and um, that sort of a, implies they don't believe Romney is an evangelical or a Christian because he's a Mormon. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, you know, their thing. It was always a this, you know, but that. Right. The problem with the guys like French and Jonah, um, and again. Jonah particularly bothers me because, I mean, he wrote a tour de force book about liberal fascism and, and how it's encroaching. And it's right. It's right on our yard and it's right here and here. And he laid it all out. I was like, holy shit, this is great. Yet when the fight really came, when you actually had a chance to fight it, you go to war with the general you got. Yep. You go to war with the army you have. Right. And the, and the guy we had was Trump, who was really kind of and they. It became again ego for them. He wasn't their guy. He was crude. He was not really a concern. He wasn't a conservative. I don't think he was ever a conservative. But my point is, like they, those guys are writers. They're not fighters. And right now, we really do need people who are going to actually fight. Who are actually going to push back and say, "Nah, I'm not going to give." Because because you know the the David French guys are always like, "Well, this isn't the hill to die on." You know, having a drag queen twerk at an at a elementary school library presentation. That's just the blessings of liberty, right? Yeah. So that's not the hill David French wants to die on. Eventually, if you don't fucking pick a hill to die on, there will be no hills for you to die on anyway. Okay. So you might as well start picking some hills because like eventually they're going to take them all from you anyway. So, so you may not, you know, that, that's what I just never understood about. You don't have to. And the other thing that was insulting with the people who, the conservatives who hated Trump, they just lumped all of us at, as, you know, toothless Trump, uh, you know, uh, de devotees that are just like, we, we're just, we don't see what's going on. Yes, we do see what's going on. We absolutely do see what's going on. We know who he is. And I like the idea that he was a freaking human claymore in Washington and that he just pissed off all these people. And I thought the creative destruction is actually, it's a good thing because we have an entrenched, we have an entrenched establishment that clearly is just, they don't give a shit about us. And Trump probably doesn't give a shit about you personally, but he's America first kind of guy. I was like, this is this is worth getting behind. And they wouldn't do it because it was ego. It was ego for them. And, you know, well, and, 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 and hey, brass tacks, who has the biggest tent out of any Republican in the last 100 years? That guy does. Trump. Trump yeah. had the biggest tent. He, he pulled in does. all kinds of people. Into the Republican Party, and he was a new, and he was a New York liberal. That's that's why I think pissed them off. Here's a New York liberal real estate dude who just yeah. took their lunch right from him. Boom, I'll yeah. take that. And they're like, yeah. "How did that happen? How did that yeah, that's, happen?" That's why. I was well, and the typical like, narrative like didn't work. I mean, he was supposed to be anti-black, anti-LGBT. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but Chris Barron, um, we hosted that. I say we, I'm actually not an L or G or B or T, but um, we hosted the LGBT for Trump um, 
uh, campaign event in, in 2016 at the convention. And in 2012, we did the same for Romney, except for Romney didn't, you know, they didn't acknowledge it or send anyone or anything like that. Um, Rick Grinnell came, but he, you know, wasn't part of the, the Romney team, um, famously. And the, a lot of people don't know this, but the very, the only party and the very first party to get the Trump Pence signs or LGBT for Trump party with Pamela Geller, Milo, it was like the day he got booted from Twitter. Um, you know, he was like actually participating in a, a nationwide campaign, not just only reaching out to people that, you know, DC and, and conservative establishment told him were, you know, his voters. Yeah. I, I, again, that was, that was just refreshing. I think that was, again, it was just a different, and my father, God bless him, you know, who died in September, he was, my dad is an extremely moral man, you know, a conservative, and, and he used to really get pissed off about the shit Trump said. And I used to say, dad, stop listening to him. Just don't listen to him. Don't, li don't listen to him. Don't hear what the news is going to tell you about him. Just what is he doing? Right. What is he actually doing? Like, like, oh, he's cutting taxes. That's kind of cool. Right. We dig that. Oh, he's going after China. Who's been eating our lunch. Oh, that's good. He told NATO to fuck off and they paid. So like all these things that he was, you know, like he's just, that's why when the conservatives like, well, he's destroying the country. I'm like, please tell me constitutionally how he's destroying the country. You have the left right here doing it right in front of you. And you didn't, the outrage, David French never had any, the level of outrage for that, that he did for Trump. And that's, that's where the bullshit came in. I was like, you're, yeah, that, that, that may lose me because I'm like, you're clearly, this isn't really what you think, what you're saying. You're not what you say you are. You're not what you say you are. He, all, he also tried to end the longest war in American history and was yeah. caused by his own administration or people within his own cabinet, you know? I yep. Mean, and he got, and he got, and it's on him or his, the people who advised him, right? Because he picked people that were, he thought were going to have his back. And he really, yeah. he really realized, I think, what a nest of vipers he had, right, Braxton? I mean, and, and the military, like, I don't know about you, dude. I pretty much don't like generals. I don't like high ranking <laughs> officers because, right. I, because I just, they're they're always they're always politicians. Even the guys in my community, even the special operations guys, you know, all oh, they're no, they're not above that. <laughs> they're not above that at all. And so, you know, Trump Trump got rolled by those cats, you know. And now we're right back to where we were before. I mean, we're really right back. Told to him to pick Bolton. That person needs to be tried and summarily redacted. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll never understand that pick, other than the fact that Trump seems to kind of pull people in at certain moments and that happened you know obviously in the campaign you had three different people that ran the campaign you know the, you know it's kind of like Corey Lewandowski launches it and then it's kind of like when you when it's come time for delegates and the whole convention you bring in Manafort because he's sort of the master at that and then in the last hour that last leg you know and, and literally it was the day that Clinton Cash graphic novel went number one on New York Times bestseller list. I get this email that says that Steve just got hired to go and run Trump's campaign. Yeah, crazy. Like, yeah. I was just like, holy shit. I'm like, well, I guess, I guess, you know, we can, you know, I guess I can, you know, there's not going to be another interview with me and Steve on the book, you know, it's like <laughs> yeah. one less person to go out and do PR for because he's, he's going to be pretty busy in the last couple of months. But Trump kind of did the same thing, you know, throughout the campaign where he'd pull people in and out. The problem is, is that he just had an absolute garbage heap as far as, uh, you know, a, a stable of talent that wasn't going to knife him in the back. Um, well, also, and don't under underestimate the, you know, ability for people to lie to someone else's face. I mean, the thing about Bolton is the person he, Bolton carried with him everywhere he went to different posts um, and who was his spokesperson at the UN was Rick Grinnell, who was one of the best people at the administration. Yeah, and, I, and, so, I, and I, I, was on, I was on Red Eye with John Bolton, and this is way back Oh man, it was a long, long time ago. And I was like a fanboy because I was a huge mm -hmm. fan of John Bolton, you know, just from what I knew, you know? So yeah, you're right. You can't really, I don't think, do you guys think Trump's going to run again? I don't, I don't no. think, he, no, no, I don't think so. I don't I think, think he, he just has, wants to stay in the news. Once, once per month, he's going to tease, you know, something, but. He can't even keep a blog going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently there, I had read their, they took that down because they're going to launch something bigger. That's what but I read. The timing was a bit off. Is You would have thought it would have went down in the next day. There's a new thing. You wouldn't think it would be weeks. I, re I read um, today, though, he's been getting all these book offers, and he said he's turned them down because he's got something else much bigger in the works. So. Well, you have something a huge. Writer, something huge. Uh, huge. Something huge. 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 <laughs> huge. I don't know. I, I Look, it's um, 
um, you know, I, I realized that, look, if you read the art of the deal, and I've read it a couple times, you'll realize that this guy loves retribution. He loves revenge. Yeah. He's not into turning yes. the other cheek. However, that book was written when he was in his 40s. Mm -hmm. When you have a different mindset and you're more of kind of a warrior, he's in his 70s now. He's kind of more of a statesman. He's sort of like more in that sort of mindset. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder, you know, is he going to turn the other cheek and walk away and just be the kingmaker, or is he going to? Is he is he still hungry for blood and he wants to come back? I, I don't know. I, I think he's still going to have a role. I just don't know. Like I think I think he'll definitely help a lot in the midterms. Then whoever the runs in twenty twenty four, he'll probably be, uh, back them. But I don't know if he himself will run. I think it all well, depends he changed, on. And he changed everything. I mean, the thing is, whatever you whatever you think of that guy, he changed everything. He changed the way everybody's looking at this, and you know, he changed the way he communicated with the country. He changed, you know, he changed. So, and like I said, he smoked out so many people that were that were just hiding in plain sight. And now, and now we know. So, I think. He, the country's better off for having him. I just don't think we need him again. I think there's, I mean, in my opinion, there's, there's other great people that, you know, well, that, I mean, look, step up. the greatest, the, you know, the number one guy is the 42 year old Gen X Florida, uh, Florida. DeSantis? Governor. I yeah. mean, DeSantis is the youngest governor in America. He's an absolute rock star. Is he only you 42? Know? Is that all he is? He's 42. He's forty-two, dude. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's young. That's I mean, young. I, I just, I just, I love You're it. You're ready to be older than the president of the United States. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, yeah that seems not right. <laughs> it, it is. It's weird, man. It's, it, it's like I just think to myself. I mean, that, that's a guy. We need like a fifty-something-year-old. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's a guy who I sat in high school with, you know, or could have basically, and now he's, you know, the. You know, the probably the, the greatest governor, the best governing guy in all. You know, in all I think we have to have America. Braxton McCoy. Braxton McCoy's got to be president because he kind of looks like a not alcoholic General Grant. <laughs> yeah, we need to go back to presidents with beard. Like I agree. <laughs> well, and and cowboy hats would also be nice too. That that would be really cool. So that would be anybody would, with a cowboy hat. Hey, there you go. go. That's your Stetson. <laughs> Stetson. Mm -hmm. We were going to talk about man. cowboy movies, but well, um, yeah, that's. that's fine. That, that's kind of my D block. We're you know we're we're pushing past an hour here. So do we want to talk about our favorite westerns since we yeah, have do a real it. life cowboy on? Yeah, and then I so, gotta so, punch out. I want to so hear. Brax, I want to hear. What, I want to hear what you guys think. Well, as, as everybody knows, you know, I mean, I you know, I'm from the great Southwest. I, I love cowboy culture. I love the great frontier. I love all that stuff because it's just ingrained in the history of this great state. And Braxton's obviously real life cowboy. Um, and, and we were talking about Westerns on Twitter not too long ago. And we were talking about like authenticity and stuff like that. But, you know, and I don't want to get into that. I just want to know everyone's favorite Western. It could be, you don't have to have just one. I don't have just one. Um, but I've got like a list of ones that I really like that really resonate. And ones that if, if are on, I can just sit down and watch no matter where they are. Where, you right. know, it's like you, that's a good, that's a good yardstick. Like if it's on, you'd be like, all right, I'm done for the day. I'm watching this. Dude, it's, it's like Delta force. I mean, when it's on, it doesn't matter where it's at. I can sit down and I'm just, and I'm just kind of stuck there, you know? Um, but, but it's the same with some of these Westerns, man. And there's something so American about the Western. It's really the only other country that really had an old West like us was Australia. They had cattle drives. Um, they call them drovers. And they had kind of an old West, but there's really nothing like the frontier and the great old West of America. And it's, you know, it's something Rax and I were talking about when we were talking on the phone the other day, Terry. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, we were talking about how, you know, even Europeans still see us at this point as cowboys. Cowboys, 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Braxton, what's, what are the ones you dig the most? Do you have some you dig the most? Uh, you know it's hard, but uh, the man who shot Liberty Valance is always mm -hmm. up there for me. Maybe that's a good one. Um, and then Hondo, which is really just kind of Shane rewritten, but yeah, probably two of my favorites. And then, I mean, if you're just going action, then you know it's Tombstone. But I wouldn't say it's like my favorite, but it's an it's an action. I think the the man who shot Liberty Valance. I think the the heart of the American cowboy story is really like moral courage, you know, physical courage is part of it, but it's really moral courage. Yeah. And I think that that's what that whole movie is really about. Yeah. yeah. And that it can I'm come a, from anyone. It doesn't have to be the right. guy, like the 100% good guy or the 100% bad guy. Right. Yeah. That's, well, that's why I like one of my favorites is the searchers uh -huh. with John Wayne. Like that was a, that was a, that was one that like a totally different kind of character for him. And, you know, 
he there was elements of him that wasn't the good guy, you know, but like I don't know, that was one of my favorite like kind of old ones. And I uh I still you know what I love? Do you, do you guys like Open Range? I love that movie. You know, that's very that 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 Open Range is based on a movie called The Hired Hand with uh Henry Fonda, which he did after Easy Rider. Um mm -hmm. and it's it's got Warren Oates in it. It's this little independent film that was made very similar um but but I, I like open range a lot um i think it's just beautifully shot yeah. it's it's one of those movies it's kind of like watching yellowstone you just sort of get capti captivated by the scenery and the look of everything it's just gorgeous mm. matt yes <laughs> give, uh, give, give us your favorite western does blazing saddles count even though it's like a parody <laughs> of uh <laughs> because that actually is my favorite of uh, that genre. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's uh, I don't know. I, you know, I guess it's a western. I mean, it's really kind of a comedy disguised as a western, but correct. It's, it's but it's, you know, it's got elements. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It does definitely. Is that, is that seriously the only western you've watched? So I I googled before this what qualifies as a western, so I wouldn't say anything that embarrasses you know the show. So uh, from the list, Django was good, and uh, No Country for Old Men, and there was like any other movies I hadn't seen. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, no country is a modern western. No, okay, yeah, I like that one. So. Yeah. Yeah. Everything McCarthy did is good. Everything he wrote is really good. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it doesn't count as a movie, but um, uh, Lonesome Dove is really good. Lonesome Dove. Lonesome Dove's great. Oh, the yeah. cowboy and scenes in there are totally accurate. That's one of the coolest parts, is like very accurate. Even like the St. Elmo's fire stuff, that really used to happen. You know, you can find that in journals of these guys. So I also yeah. like uh I and I got it was cool because I did we did a whole episode of this on my show, um Quigley Down Under was mm -hmm. was was you know, that was like and I was talking to Tom Selleck, that was like the favorite movie he ever did. That's his favorite movie he ever did was Quigley Down Under. That was kind of cool. All the Clint Eastwood ones, too. I mean, like that kind of changed because the, the time period that they came out and they were done over in Spain and Italy and stuff like that. Like, you know, Good, the Bad, the Ugly, Josie Wales, all those kind of, I don't know if Josie Wales wasn't done over there, but Good, the Bad, the Ugly was. Like those yeah. sort of Sergio Leone kind of Westerns mm -hmm. with the music and the eyes, <laughs> shit like that. I don't know, man. I, I think a modern Western, and it's not a movie, but I think it's a great television show and it's a Western, but it's not, but it's justified. Like, have you ever seen? Have you ever seen that show, Braxton? I have not. No, dude, yeah, you, I mean, need to, you need to watch that show. It's great. I'll watch it. That's uh, James Elroy, who's um, or no, is it Elmore Leonard? It's 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 Elmore Leonard. Right, right. I always get those two mixed up for some reason. But it's Elmore Leonard. I mean, and he's you know that's Jackie Brown. That's uh, Fifty Two Pickup. Out of sight. That guy's written. But Timothy T Timothy Oliphant is the star of that. Nick Cersei's in that. He plays his boss. Yeah. And dude, it's about this marshal who is just, a, I mean, it's just like five seasons of it. I don't know why they canceled it. But it was like, he goes back to you know, Harlan, Kentucky. And, uh, cause he gets in trouble. He shoots a bad guy and it was, it, and it was justified. As he says, he goes, he pulled first. It was justified. And he goes back to his old stomping grounds and goes against his boyhood friend, Boyd Crowder. Play, what's that guy's name? Walter Goggins plays. Yeah, he's him, insane. Who's yeah. so great? And these two guys. What's great about it is, and you know, the best quote is, "We dug coal together." So these two guys were friends, Braxton, growing up in this really hard part of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. One of the guys ended up becoming a criminal, career criminal, and one of them became a marshal. And then they end up getting back, they end up bumping paths again. And it's all about. There's a lot of crossing of like who's who's kind of good, who's bad, but a lot of that kind of that moral courage, like Olaf and Oliphant looks like it. Cause he's that kind of tall rangy cowboy looking dude. And he's got the cowboy hat. He wears that horseshoe ring mm. and he fucking kills motherfuckers. And it's just, it's, but it's a really, <laughs> it's really good. Like it was a really, it kind of seems oh. wet. It's, it's Western, but it's modern to me. It's yeah. like kind of that same thing. Sounds well, like you, a Chris Knight song. <laughs> Well, you get like you get all, you get all those really crazy characters that uh, Elmer Leonard so so famous for, and, and I think one of the reasons why they stopped production on Justified was because Elmer Leonard died somewhere right. around season five, yeah. and, and he right. was kind yeah. of he was kind of approving and looking over the writing and whatnot, and kind of making sure that it was all within sort of the scope. Because there's only two stories written around Raylan. One is called Pronto. One's called Riding the Rap. And they're and they're short stories. Um, uh, one and then also and and, and that one fire in the based, hole. Fire in the hole is based on the the pilot, um, right. which is which is hilarious. Um, I mean, every time I watch Walt Goggins shoot that shoulder fire rocket and yell fire in the hole, I just 
fucking crack up because it's, it's, it's just it's just insane. But um, you know, you know, it's just I, I I love Deadwood so much, and Tim did such a great job as Seth Bullock. It was I've never a, seen Deadwood. Shame on me. I've never. You got to watch it, man, because it's probably one of the best right of center libertarian tales that Hollywood. Yeah, ever I, I heard that, man. I heard so, that. You know, and David Milch. I'm not exactly sure the politics of David Milch, but I know he's really good friends with John Milius. So, and he was in the Milius documentary, and he also paid for Milius's kid uh, Ethan to go to law school. John paid him back, but um, after he did Rome, and and then and then David Milch is like. Can you believe this Milius guy? He's like, he's the only son of a bitch in this town. If, you know, you know, I've been in Hollywood for 30 years. He's the only son of a bitch that ever pay me back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Lisa, you got your Westerns? Yes. Well, I mean, I really, my, I have a 100% favorite, which is an Elmore Leonard and the remake. So don't judge me, but 310 to Yuma. Okay. No, that was yeah. cool. That yeah. was good. And Great it's like movie. the best writing. And if, if you do want to become a better writer, Elmore Leonard has a ten list or a list of ten writing tips that I always like try to stick to. <laughs> really? Yeah. No shit. I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really good. Um, and then also, I think it's it used to be free on Amazon Audibles if you like want a quick um, like audiobook, but um, Henry Rollins re reads 310 to Yuma um, in the audiobook. Oh, wow. I, I love the original, which is Glenn Ford, uh, one of my favorite actors. And, and the original was filmed down in Cochise County in Dragoon in Texas Canyon. Um, and it was also filmed at Tucson Studios. Um, I, I liked the remake as well. I thought it was well done. James, James Goldman, who also did uh, Ford versus Ferrari and the Wolverine movies, Old Man Logan, great director. I think I think remakes too. I think I, I hate to say this because I'm a huge John Wayne fan. I think the remake of True Grit was better than the original. <laughs> well, wasn't it wasn't it more faithful to the book? It was, dude. Have you seen the remake, Braxton? Yeah, sure. yeah I have. Yeah. What do you yeah. think? I thought that was good. I thought, yeah, it was good. Yeah, it's yeah. hard for me. I, well, I grew up on John Wayne, so it's yeah. I, that's what I say. I hate saying it because I'm going to catch some shit for it, but I actually, <laughs> I don't know. I well, just like I like I like the remake, man. I thought that was it was just maybe it was just the casting with Jeff Bridges and and Bridges and, uh, is amazing. You know, you, know, you got to have a lot of guts. I mean, I, I give I give Jeff Bridges kudos. We share the same birthday. He's 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 awesome. Just by just by way of well, that. Well, that means Terry sh shares the same birthday. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Terry, he's a December fourth baby. Is Jeff he really? Bridges. Yeah. Well, that yeah, explains so, everything, doesn't it? Then it sounds like uh, <laughs> Chris Hillman, who was the who was in the Birds. Um, I think um, I think Tyra Banks is a December fourth birthday. <laughs> oh, so well, there you go. There's a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> All right. like Do I look like I give a fuck? Because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So mine, I, I cannot whittle it down. So like when it comes to uh, authenticity, I'm going to go with Lonesome Dove um, just because, you know, that movie's more about the metal that it takes to drive a bunch of cattle from basically Del Rio, Texas, where they filmed that thing all the way up to Montana. And that's, you know, that takes a lot of guts and a lot of fortitude. Um, and, you know, and obviously a lot of people along the way either die or, you know, don't make it. And so turn around, turn back, you know, but I love that movie. And it's uh, it was what was it a four, four, four part miniseries. Four or five. Yeah. Yeah. It was a big it, miniseries on TV. It a, yeah. And, 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 it, and it drew huge, huge. It was great. It was great. Brax, you know, it's funny because Brax, Braxton, you've talked about this before. And I was I thought it was fascinating. A lot of, you know, the West, a lot of Westerns deal with like, um, you know, gunfighters and, you know, all that kind of shit. But like you've talked a lot about how really it's like the like you can't imagine. I cannot imagine what it was like to be a pioneer, like to right. get in right. And to and to just basically bring your family, your wife, your kids and some animals and and just go out there and just deal with all the shit that was coming at you. So you, you know, there was no grocery stores. You had to provide all your own food, you had to provide all your own security. You might have to make deals with if there's Indians there or, or other, you know what I mean? Like the pioneer thing was, I think maybe it's not as sexy as the gunfighter shit, but that really, you've talked about that Braxton is that's really the West. I mean, that really is it, isn't it? In a lot of ways, I think it defined America really. Yeah. hundred percent. And it, you could, the, the way to think of it is taking everything 
that you can possibly carry in like maybe a boat or whatever <laughs> and going to Afghanistan and then trying to farm Afghanistan. Like that, that's really what it would be. That's well, amazing. That's how people ended up here even before the West. I mean, that they came across to somewhere they didn't know and to make their way. Mayflower. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, you think about the bravery, especially um, you were talking about Columbus earlier and, you know, he's a war criminal. He's this mass murderer. No, he was a really smart guy who had the balls to get on a ship yeah. and go for months without really knowing where he was going necessarily, and then yeah. try and cultivate this new world. I mean, I don't see well, those guys too. That's another thing too. I was, there was a, there was a, I'm, I'm too old for all of you on this, but there was a series that was out in the seventies and it was narrated by Anthony Quinn and it was called 10 who dared. And it was a, a lot about, it was a lot about the conquistadors and the explorers like Magellan and all these other guys. And those dudes, when you think it's kind of the same spirit, the same vibe mm -hmm. where you're like, you're stepping off into the note from the known world. And then on this map here, it just says here, here, there be dragons, right? Yeah. You literally don't, you have no fucking idea what's there. And like some of these dudes never came back, you know, you never heard from them again. Cause they just starved to death or they're on the, they're at sea. They got in a wreck or, you know, bad stuff happened. So like that idea, I like I like to think of myself probably falsely as you know kind of tough and I can put up with a lot of shit. I'm nothing like those people. Man. Those yeah, people but, were, that was a different breed of people, man. Yeah, but Terry, I mean, that's one of the things I love about Dude, You're Screwed and some of the other survival shows is that it kind of pulls in that element of dropping somebody into the middle of nowhere and you've got to kind of hack your way into survival. And you know, whether it's a friction fire or you know, uh, building a hooch or processing water. I mean, these are all things that my great, my great grandfather came to Arizona in a covered wagon before. It That's was crazy. Thing. That's crazy, dude. Like I, like I, I can just walk over to the kitchen right now. I just turn on, I turn a lever and drinkable water comes out. Mm. Oh, I can even turn it and I can make it hot if I want to. <laughs> what the fuck? Like they didn't have that. No one had that. Like I, if I'm hungry, I can go to the store, you know, like I can hunt and stuff like that. I'm kind of lazy, but like, you know what I mean? Like it, <sighs> They, those those people were, and it's just, it's just they're just a lot harder. They're just much harder people, and they dealt with. Again, when you have that kind of life, that's how you know society is kind of set for collapse. Like we are, didn't Bane say that in the in the Batman movie? Like your success has defeated you, mm. right? Your comfort has made you soft, and and it really does. Like, and I admit it. Like I, you know, could I could I have done what those guys did in the eighteen hundreds and come out in, in a covered wagon? And not know where the I mean, like, yeah. people, you know, I just and and survive that way. You did lose children, kids would yeah. die, people would die, and it was just like there's just a level of grit, like real, real fucking yeah. grit. And that was kind of that did define it defined America really in a way. I mean, it really defined America. And I think yeah. that kind of self reliance and that kind of like you know just just toughness is that's also is very dis it's it's distasteful to sort of academics and the cultural left where they're like, yeah, no, that's, that's just great. No, that's the way it was, dude. You're here right now. We're on this stupid computer talking because people did that and they did it. They, and they, and a lot of them never came back and suffered terrible hardship. That's another, another, uh, it's not really Western. It's kind of a sub genre, but like, I like the mountain man movies too. Like, Oh yeah. Jeremiah Johnson. Johnson. Jeremiah Johnson. And, yeah. and, uh, the one with, um, Oh my God! I just forgot the title of it. The one with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, oh yeah, the Revenant. Revenant. That, Revenant. The Revenant was that was yeah. a really good movie, man. Like that, and that was that was those guys were hard. Those guys were hard motherfuckers, man. Yeah. Uh, that movie makes me so mad. The Revenant. I he's supposed to be in Montana, Wyoming area, and it opens up in like the marshes of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> like hunting. Oh, it drives me crazy. But I mean, you yeah. know. Yeah, those those kind of details bother me. It, it's one of the things. Uh, Tombstone's in my top five, uh, and Tombstone. I have a really good friend, Bob Bozbell, who runs True West Magazine. He was a technical advisor on um, for a couple days on Tombstone, made sure all the hats were period. And um, there's a lot that Tombstone got right when it comes to things like "I'm Your Huckleberry" and the gunfight. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of historically accurate stuff in Tombstone. The Vendetta ride is what's basically Hollywoodized up. I mean, Wyatt really only shot maybe like two or three people after Morgan was was killed. And one of them was here at the Tucson Trail uh, train yards, which is depicted in the movie, 
you know, the whole, you know, you tell them I'm coming and hell's coming with me. That really happened uh, because there were witnesses. There was tons yeah. of witnesses to the OK Corral gunfight, which <laughs> happened in a lot, maybe about 30 feet wide. These guys were all about maybe 15 feet apart from, and it all happened within like 30 seconds. These guys just cut loose of dozens of rounds. So gun and, boys, man. <laughs> real fast, real fast, you know, and, 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 and everybody got hit except Wyatt. Wyatt never got hit. He never got shot. He never even got gray. And, and back then too, if you got shot, there's just a good chance you're going to die a slow death of infection. And oh like, yeah. I mean, Oh yeah. yeah. It's yeah. going to be brutal, especially a gut shot. The worst scene in Tombstone is that one. I mean, it's – but when he cuts him with his spur, oh, that causes me such torture because now anytime I post a picture, a bunch of freaking New Jersey cat moms get on there and talk about how brutal my spurs are and all this, you know. Oh, it makes me so mad. Like, I'm, I know this is inside. It's a personal thing. It's grudge. But I wear, like, big Mexican rows on my spurs, you know. I mean, you can hear them all the time. But you wear big rows so it's easier on the Yes. That's what, like those little tiny ones is harder. It's more pounds per or pressure per square inch. You know, right. man, uh, Braxton, you I've seen, you know, touch them, you know, people, people don't understand horses. I've, uh, the guy that I, I was a apprentice to a farrier for, for a while. I've seen, I've seen this guy take a rasp and just whack the shit out of a horse. I mean, they have a high pain threshold. It's a 1500 pound beast, man. But this horse was leaning on him and, and he, and he wouldn't let up. So, so Shane stood up and he had this big rasp. He just goes, Pow! Running the horse, the horse, you know, like bucks up. I mean, dude, I've seen. Hey, Braxton, I've seen if I guy. come out, Braxton, if I come out there, will you teach me how to ride a horse? Right? I would love to, Terry. <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> that'd be Braxton, awesome. I, I saw this guy uh, actually take a horse by the ears and drop it all the way down to the ground. I've never seen anything like it before. But well, you know, horses, most people don't know, are prey animals. I mean, that's why you can kind of push them around like you do. But yeah, um, you got to. You got to make them. You're not a mountain lion. That's, that's right. That's right. You got to show them who's boss. Um, so, so wild bunch. I'm also going to throw in there because one of the things I love about the wild bunch is not only the action that it's Sam Peckinpah, but also I love the fact that this is kind of the end of the old west. In the beginning of the movie, they encounter a car, the first vehicle, the first car that they've ever seen, and then they talk about a plane. And these guys are kind of like sort of outliving their usefulness. They're all becoming like 40 something probably and they're robbing banks and they're robbing train cars and you can't really do that anymore because of radio or um, uh, you know the, the telephone lines going up everywhere and Morse code and and I just love the fact that it's sort of these men sort of out of time and that's sort of the way Sam Peckinpah always felt that he was sort of born in the wrong era and that movie was sort of a uh, uh, sort of a love letter to those guys who kind of came to the end of the west and met that new world and it it just didn't really work <laughs> well and westerns also kind of reflect i guess all film does but like westerns especially sort of reflect on how the country feels about itself and about mm -hmm. kind of what how they view things so like in the 80s there were this sort of a return to like like Silverado and those kind of movies where it was like, you know, the celebration of the West was almost like a, like a, like an homage to these movies, to the old Westerns. And then you, yeah, then you have like the unforgiven, which was completely That's like different. The unforgiven is like the deconstruction. Yeah. Of the and, and, and again, it's a great movie in its own right, but I mean, again, it's just sort of different how people are, how they sort of view the, what's a hero. Who's not a hero. Yeah. Like who can be respected, who cannot be like, what was the right thing to do? What was the wrong thing to do? Like, you know, the fifties Westerns, those big cinema scope ones. And yeah, as opposed to like sort of the nitty gritty kind of ones now where, you know, and then, you know, like the Clint Eastwood ones with those, you know, everybody was unshaven. They all, you could almost smell the dudes. Like they looked yeah. dirty. <laughs> and I think that was again, kind of a cool, a different take on it, you know, and a different, a different take on it, but it's, it's sort of, they, Westerns reflect sort of culturally where we are, you know? Uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up guys. Cause I know, I know we're, we're running <laughs> long here. So I'm, I'm going to throw young, I'm, I'm going to throw young guns in there too, only because it just, um, it got awesome. me interested in history, man. You know? Um, yeah. Young yeah. guns was cool. Yeah. Well, young guns was really cool. Yeah, you throw that rock and roll soundtrack in there, which was uh, something they did in the last two weeks of post-production. They, Jerry Goldsmith like scored that whole thing with a, with an orchestra and, Dean Kane's dad, Chris Kane, the director said, Hey, I think we need to go to something more current. And, you know, the young kids love the rock and roll. So let's give them what they want. But that was a nice aesthetic that they added to that movie, which made it commercial. And then you got all those kids to go watch it and get interested in the West. So, anyway, um, yeah, there's older brothers in it, even too. Who's that? Lou Diamond Phillips. Yeah. 
Don't you think he looks like Tulsi Gabbard? I always make that joke. Like, <laughs> yeah, they look like they're related. I never <laughs> thought of that, man. Holy <laughs> shit. Now you just ruined it for me, man. <laughs> well, he's a handsome man. He is. he is. He's a handsome man. He's a handsome the man. The man doesn't age. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, he does. He looks he's exactly devil. the same. Yeah. <laughs> the, man, I'm going to take these go. dogs out for a walk. <laughs> That's it. Sounds good. Hey, why don't we get everybody to uh, talk about, uh, give everybody social media coordinates. Where can everybody find you guys? If you got something going on or something you want to sell or you want to plug, do it now. Um, I'm on Twitter and I uh, just buy every book I've ever written. I guess. <laughs> just search on Amazon and Apple. Yeah, I'm there. And just check all the boxes. Yeah. Also, boycott Amazon, but not my book. <laughs> <laughs> what the Lisa, hell? where can people find you? Um, they can find me on Twitter on Lisa D E and on Instagram at least underscore D E P because some lesser known Lisa D Pasquale got the other one. Wow. <laughs> Braxton, what do you got going on aside from your book, which I encourage everyone to go out and pick up? It's called The Glass Factory. It's a fantastic book. We're going to make it into a graphic novel at some point in time. <laughs> it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, please read it. People say good stuff about it. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Braxton underscore McCoy. I've got another book coming out in December that I'm writing with a friend of mine. And then hopefully I'll get this other book I've been working on for a year and a half done at some point. Um, so I'm going to. Oh, awesome, dude! Is it a, is it a nonfiction book or a uh, both book? of those are nonfiction? Yeah, right on, dude. That's awesome. That but awesome. About culture and a lot about this stuff with the West. So if you're nice. into that, it'll be in there. Awesome, dude, Brax. I'm gonna have you back. Uh, we should do a one on one on the book. That would be fun. We can get get awesome. more into it, and then and also have you back because I can finish the book, and then we can really talk about it. <laughs> so well, thanks, for being, Thank you. Oh, you bet, dude. Uh, Terry, what do you got going on? I know you just well, wrapped up. I reckon, I'll, I reckon I'll sign back into Twitter today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I had to get a new phone. And anyway, yeah, so Terry Shepard, Twitter. I just got done filming season five, Bollywood Weapons, and got another rescue dog. And I will say this about Braxton's book. We talked about it in the beginning. I just want to say thanks for writing it. Um, I held on to it for months. Because I just knew it was going to affect me, so I, I apologize, Braxton, to you as a man for not no. reading it right away. Because I just was, I, I carried it everywhere. I was like, "All right, I got to start this," and I was like, eh, "Next week." And next thing you know, months go by. So, but it, I would tell anybody to read it. Um, it's a really raw, personal uh, account of what Braxton went through after being really fucked up in combat and what he had to overcome. And it's, uh, you don't have to have been in a gunfight in Iraq to, to get something out of it. it. It It's one of those books that I'm just going to keep near my bed. And uh, it's just one of those things that I, you know, when guys write books like that, you need to pay attention because it's, it's giving you an insight into you. Like I was like a lot of that shit, dude, uh, that you were dealing with and, and doing. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like me. And that's, you know, Suffering is universal and struggle is universal and overcoming that is universal. So read his book as soon as you can, for sure. Hey, hey Terry, when, when can we expect uh, the new season of Hollywood Weapons? Oh, yeah. So I don't think it's going to air till September. They were going to – initially they were pushing, pushing, pushing. We did the whole thing in like three and a half weeks, which was a grind, uh, which is good because now it's done. Uh, I um, It's going to be in September. So mm -hmm. – so basically, I'm I'm sort of free this summer just to lay on my fat ass. So I'm kind of <laughs> Tell Larry to settle down. I'll be down there in a couple months. Yeah, That's I can't right. wait for you guys to come down. You guys always know this place is open to you. Um, now you tell me after I shell out three thousand dollars for a place. What? <laughs> hey no. man, it costs to live at the beach. And Gates what can comes I tell down. You? Right. All right. Well, hey, we're sadly we're out of time. Everyone make sure and subscribe to Political Punk's channel on Rumble and YouTube so you never miss any of our new videos. Like and share this video far and wide. Also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, everyone stay frosty. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You look, like, you look like you're going to be on Dallas. You look great. <laughs>